Okay, critical race theory. A lot of people don't know what it is. People get really angry over it. In fact, people got so angry over it that the president of the United States has made it a component of his platform to say that he wants to ban its teaching in federal institutions. So, okay, listen, I'm speaking directly to the conservatives who watched me. There are dozens of you, and I want to lend, uh, lend me your ear for a second because the discourse around critical race theory is deranged. It is absolutely deranged, and to an extent I mean that on both sides. The issue is that critical race theory is really just a term to describe a loose collection of academic theories to describe our understanding of racial inequality. There are critical race theorists who would disagree with each other if you put them both in a room. In fact, I had to write papers on conflicting theories that would both be described as components of critical race theory. So the idea that it's like this singular monolithic idea is really, really, in fact, it's so broad that taking issue with critical race theory, it's like taking issue with like, like trigonometry or something. You're not just taking issue with a set of conclusions, you're taking issue with like an entire doctrine of academic understanding. And while there are some things in that, you know, uh, under that umbrella of critical race theory that I don't think are great, I don't agree with. Uh, okay, so let's suss this out, okay? Let's suss this out. So, the big issue that we often have with critical race theory is that we don't agree on the problem it's trying to solve. See, critical race theory is about, broadly, it's about analyzing power structures that relate to race. And that's really it. That's, I mean, that's super, super, super broad. It's about understanding that race is a component of a multilateral social system where certain groups are afforded more power over other groups and that that whole mess needs to be untangled for us to address racism. Does that make sense? It's, it's like the basic premise is really, really simple. The issue is a lot of right-leaning people don't really think racism exists so they're never going to put critical race theory in an appropriate context so when somebody says something like white people have some kind of internalized racial prejudice against black people in general which sounds like a you know a fairly sort of harsh statement like i'm not racist you know um a lot of conservatives will get really 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 angry about that like really fucking angry though because th their morality is being impugned in that respect and the issue is that first of all um facts don't care about your feelings and second of all we can't actually talk about the importance of academic theories which are meant to describe these problems and solve them unless we can agree on the problems i've talked about systemic racism a million times in the past but if you want a brief refresher, and I have stuff in the document about this, it is a factual, empirical, provable point that in this country, people of color, black and brown people, and it gets more complicated with Asian people because there are different these sort of demographic extents to which their oppression is extended, but generally speaking, non-white people in this country got the short end of the stick for a wide variety of cultural issues. We're not even talking, we're not talking about biology, we're just talking about like how the dice of history end up rolling. You know what I mean? Because of things like systemic inequality and generational inequality. If a group of people have less money a hundred years ago because of slavery, and groups of people tend to keep roughly the same proportional amount of money without any kind of redistributive program, then that thing's going to continue into the future. Basically forever, unless we do something about it. The reason I'm bringing all this up is because there was a viral Twitter thread the other day. I don't know what counts as viral anymore. Scoop! San Diego Unified School District is forcing teachers to attend white privilege training in which teachers are told you are racist and you are upholding racist ideas, structures, and policies. The leaked documents from this training session will shock you. First of all, I love the fact that when conservatives get outraged about stuff like this, it's always like a PowerPoint being done at like a school district or something like that, you know? Like, broad public policy, hundreds of thousands of people dead from COVID, whatever, dude. Or there are stories of police officers and teachers being severely racist, and these are individual cases as well, but they'll shrug them off. It's like, oh, whatever, bad apples. But then, when you have 
the Marxist critical race theory PowerPoint. This, this is an indication of systemic corruption on a global scale. This is the downfall of Western civilization right here. Like, the, the degree of severity assigned is so, so, so off. I also like the fact that conservatives are always the ones saying that teachers are like the agents of Marxist corruption, but now teachers are actually the victims of Marxist corruption. Do you see that like uh, do you see that weird like shift? Usually they're saying the teachers are the ones indoctrinating the students, but now that the teachers are being taught something, they're the ones being indoctrinated. But by who? It's an interesting question. I don't know. Is some people got competing theories about who's responsible for this one. It really depends on what community you're in. They got, they got lots of ideas. So, okay. <clears throat> Let's take a look at this PowerPoint, huh? We'll see if we can contextualize any of this. The one thing that I will say off the bat is that academic theories don't translate into common discourse very well. I don't think, generally speaking, a, a term that is intended for use between academics who understand the concept and who can engage with it in a very nuanced and direct way, who aren't dealing with politics in the same way that we are outside of academia, who aren't dealing with like PR or with optics. That stuff, that academic stuff, it doesn't always translate well into public discourse. And if you look throughout history, there are, there are so many examples of ideas which run really, really, really well in an academic community suddenly looking like really bad and optically terrible outside of that community. Usually this falls within the purview of sociology, law, political science, and, um, well, oh god, how many, <laughs> the term white fragility, white fragility, the term privilege, um, the term, oh, colonizer, oh god, when 14-year-olds when call people colonizers on Twitter, I'm gonna kill myself. There are so many terms that just get used and abused, but so with that being said, toxic masculinity is a big one. Yeah, 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 yeah. Triggered. Yeah, uh, trigger. Tr the term triggered didn't always mean angry online. The term triggered used to be like it referred to a specific physiological reaction that people with PTSD got certain stimulus, you know? Like you would say like um, the Vietnam War veteran was triggered by the fireworks. But now if you say that, people will laugh. It's considered an insult. If I said like the war vet was triggered by the fireworks, that's like, that would be considered an insult because now the term triggered involves like an understanding of triviality. Like I'd be making fun of them. Is triggered ableist? I, if it, I don't, whatever. It's, whether we like it or not, it's common discourse now. Um, so, uh, look. The training begins with a land acknowledgement in which the teachers are asked to accept they are colonizers living on stolen Native American land. They are told they will experience guilt, anger, apathy, and closed-mindedness because of their white fragility. All right, let's hit it up, people. Land acknowledgement. We igno okay, so let's, let's d determine the accuracy of these statements. We acknowledge that we meet on stolen land taken from indigenous peoples. That, I mean, that's objectively true. Again, we're not, this isn't being given to students. This is being given to teachers. These people all have degrees. We're not giving this to 17-year-olds. We're giving this to adults. And this is true, okay? I am speaking to you from Kumeyaay Kumeya land. We must acknowledge the hidden history of violence against indigenous peoples in an effort to move towards justice. Yeah, this is factually the... Uh, like, again, facts don't care about your feelings. There's nothing... Again, we're talking about teachers here. These aren't students. Like, teachers... If there is a workshop um, where people are meant to be explained sociological issues in like a harsh tone, teachers are literally the number one group of people that should be able to handle this. Norms and agreements. All right, what is this? Share the air, take space and leave space. Be brave, speak your truth and listen to others' truths. Okay, this is just some drum circle shit. Be mindful and fully present. Expect to experience discomfort. Wait, they underline that? Dude, why are conservatives such fucking snowflakes? They underline that? Expect to experience discomfort? This is what's upsetting them? Jesus Christ. The, look at that. Look at that critical race theory pamphlet they provided. And it says, like, 
be aware some of these ideas may be uncomfortable to you. And they're like, Wah! the conservatives are unironically triggered by this. They're triggered by a PowerPoint slide acknowledging that some people may be made. How, wait, how many conservative demagogues open their segments by saying something like, uh, if, I, if this show makes you uncomfortable, you're free to leave because this is the United States and I'm not going to censor myself for you. That's literally like the tagline of 90% of conservative discourse. And now you're saying that it's evidence of, of crazy Marxist indoctrination? Okay. Allow others to learn what you know. Respect confidentiality. Take the stories, leave the names, take care of yourself. Solved. Fine. Be explicit about race and racism. Avoid and point out coded language. That's, again, that's, yeah. Teachers should definitely be doing this, by the way. You, do, you never want to use coded language in an academic setting when you're talking about sensitive sociological issues. That can get really bad. Um, effective dialogue requires active listening, value and leverage our interconnectedness. Okay, so this is literally just everyone be nice to each other. White fragility. Oh, they're not going to like this one. Emotions, racial stress that are stirred when making white people consider racial realities. Guilt, anger, apathy, frustration, closed-mindedness, and defensiveness. I like this. So the tweet here, um, the tweet here says that they will experience guilt, anger, apathy, and closed-mindedness because of their white fragility. But in the actual PowerPoint, it's only saying this is a component of white fragility. They don't even understand the PowerPoint they're looking at. Nothing here, nothing in this PowerPoint is saying you will feel these feelings. It, what's funny here is that the conservative tweets here are a perfect example of white fragility. Look, okay, I hate to be super, like, prescriptive like this, but I've been doing this for two years now. I've argued with a lot of conservatives. White people are fragile as fuck when it comes to talking about race issues. They are insanely fragile. The issue is, and I have to remind you guys, I have never felt guilt about being white in my entire life. I've never apologized. I've argued with fucking crazy ass POC who are unironically anti-white. I have gotten canceled by lefties for criticizing people for being anti-white. I'm not like riddled with guilt and I don't think you should be riddled with guilt. None of us should be riddled with guilt. You're born with your skin tone, whatever. Not a big deal, you know? Just Whatever your station in life, whatever your demographic status, just be aware of how that affects other people. I'm only asking for introspection here. I'm not asking for you to feel guilty. But a lot of conservatives act. Like when I talk about race issues, I am asking, I am demanding them to personally feel guilty or even feel bad about being white. I don't feel bad about being white. I don't think people should feel bad about being privileged at all. I think you guys miss the mark on that sometimes. Every once in a while, I'll get an a email from somebody, and they're like, Hey, so I own property, and I rent it out, and I only became a lefty last year, and now I feel really guilty, and I don't, can I even be a leftist? Like, dude, you own a property. Okay, Ch chill. Don't. You know, if you want to do something about that, you can. If you want to sell that property, you can. You're allowed to, but don't freak out. There are people who are like, um, I'm rich. Am I allowed to be like, dude, I'm rich. They, you people, you, your gifted subs, don't feel bad. Privilege isn't morally weighted. It's just a tool that you can use. There's nothing wrong with it. The idea that there's some guilt value assigned to this is... Yeah, be a class trader. Engels was rich. Be a class trader. That makes you so cool. Dude, nothing is cooler. Listen, especially if you're in college, okay? Nothing makes you cooler than the person. Everyone thinks you're preppy, you know? Everyone thinks you're preppy. You walk into school, you're wearing, what's clothing? You're Gucci's. You're wearing, you're wearing uh, Tim's on your shoulders like pauldrons. And everyone's like, uh, what, a, what a preppy, douchey, that outfit is $3,000. Mm -hmm. And then you invite them all to the party, and you're, you're just wall-to-wall -wall fucking Soviet newspapers about the launch of Sputnik into low orbit, okay? Just wall-to-wall, -wall, and all of your, all of your furniture is, is, is collectivized furniture, okay? Beanie bags, collectivized. Single-seat chairs, capitalist. Remember, people, the, there's nothing wrong with being privileged. But the way conservatives act when I point out the objective, factual, empirical case that white privilege exists, they get really fucking fragile.
they get really fragile about they're really uncomfortable to which and i have to say my facts they do not care about your feelings i'm really sorry that you're so uncomfortable with these ideas but i'm not going to stop talking about them just because they make you uncomfortable i would say there's something wrong with a system that privileges others though yeah of course we're all socialists here that's what we're trying to fix right but just because you live on the upper end of the pyramid you were born onto doesn't mean you're in the wrong you were born there or you work to get there okay wait i'll even extend this further even if you, it wasn't a product of your birth circumstances, even if you worked crazy hard to rise your way up the system to become very wealthy or something, just don't feel guilty. Whatever. I mean, if you did, like, bad things, I guess you can feel bad about that, but the privilege in and of itself is not something to be guilty over. Also, don't feel proud. You can feel proud of things you worked for. I'm proud of this channel. I've worked hard for this channel. I'm very proud of this channel. And the benefits that it's, you know, accrued for me. You shouldn't be proud of things you didn't work for, though. That's just simple logic. How cringe to be proud of your, like, be proud of your, like, nation, you know? Or, like, proud of your, like, skin color. You know, a lot of conservatives, they say, like, well, black pride is a thing. Dude, when people are doing, like, black pride, they're not, like announcing the superiority of their skin tone. At least I don't think most of them are. It's not generally the way black pride parades go. It's usually about saying, you can't put me down for my race. That's the collective. Same with gay pride, by the way. Same with gay pride. That's generally the tone with these things, you know? It's not my fault that every white pride event turns into a fucking cl a clan or rally, you know? That's not... I didn't make it that way. That's just how it keeps happening. But black pride rallies are... Korean pride or gay pride rallies, you know, you just go there and you, I don't know, get smacked in the face with a dildo or I've never been to a Korean pride rally. I'm sure they're wonderful. Anyway, we're losing the plot here. <laughs> okay. Um, after watching clips of Robin D'Angelo and Ibram McKenzie, the trainers tell the teachers, you are racist. You are upholding racist ideas, structures, and policies. And then they must commit to becoming anti-racist in the classroom. They must submit to the new racial orthodoxy. So again, I have to point out the snowflake language from the conservative here. They must submit to the new racial orthodoxy. Why all of the weighted language here? It's a fucking PowerPoint giving them ideas. What is it? They must submit. It is in the. It's it's a discussion point. Like it's it, it's a it's a seminar. It's not about submitting, okay? Like, chill. The language these conservatives use, they're like drama students. They're like grade one theater students trying to write out a play, you know? They don't have any interesting ideas or anything to show, so they just, like, you know, they, they purple prose every single element of their story structure. Also, I think it's interesting that the tweet uh, says, the trainers tell the teachers, you are racist, you are upholding racist ideas, structures, and policies, but apparently that's only something that they got on voice. The actual PowerPoint doesn't seem to say this. So here's the question, people. Oh, wait, hold on, sorry. The, the title says this. Oh, shit, never mind, the title says it. Oh, hold on. In the chat, try to use one word to answer the question. How would this make you feel? Think to yourself, what would you want to say to someone who tells you this? They misinterpreted it! The questions aren't saying you're racist. The questions are asking you how you would respond to being told that. The follow-up question, how would this, literally, how would this make you feel? What would you want to say to someone who tells you this? The, literally, the follow-up. You, Why would you screenshot this? If you had only screenshotted the title, then I, because I don't have access to the source material, I would have to say, oh, I guess they did say that. I think that's a little irresponsible to just throw that out there. But nope, no reading comprehension, people. Literally, the follow-up sentences. I, I don't know. I Again, conservative illiteracy is, is, a, is a, a component of the, I swear to God, 90% of my engagement with conservatives really does boil down to just them not, it's either unable or unwilling to read. This is incredible. I think this is a good question, by the way.
Because if we're exploring our relationship with the concept of racism, especially after a segment on white fragility, I think it is important to answer, how would you feel if somebody accused you of being racist? Now, I get accused of being racist all the time. Nazis accuse me of being anti-white, and the lefties who don't like me very much, uh, they accuse me of being anti-everyone else, you know? Um, so, I, I mean, I, I know how I respond to this, usually by telling people to fuck off, but um, I think it's an interesting question. But there's a world of difference between just telling a group of teachers they're racist and posing that statement as a subject of discussion. Anyway, what's the next panel? Yeah, the, the next, it's the same thing for the next one. It's not saying they're X, it's posing it as a subject of discussion. So, yeah. I don't know. Well. A swing and a miss. Okay. The teachers are told they are part of an oppressive white power structure. I mean, that's the case for every human being in America. Not just America, of course, but in America, right? Yeah. If we live in an... So, hold on. Let's break this down word by word. If we live in an oppressive white power structure, which we do, and that's demonstrable empirically, then if you, if you live in that structure, then you're part of it. Anti-racists are also a part of that structure. The antagonism to the system is a part of the system, after all, you know? Part of the uh, slave state social structure that, that this country had for hundreds of years were abolitionists. They were a part of that system. They were part of the one word to use a word, dialectical advancement of historical progress. But, you know, we're not ready to have that conversation. Okay, hold on. Um, the trainers claim that white people in America hold most of the power, stay triggered, I guess, that's true, and that white teachers have an ability to thrive that is being preserved at every level of power. Yeah. Yeah, that's just white privilege. There are so Conservatives get so angry at the concept of white privilege, it's unbelievable to me. Like, and the funny thing is, here's the funny thing, by the way. Most of the people who get angry at the concept of white privilege are like insecure fucking white dudes in high school. Or not most of them, but a lot of them are. And these people know what Chad privilege is. That's the real kicker. They know what Chad privilege is. Unironically, if a guy with a square jaw, six foot three, rippling muscles, blonde hair swept back, came up to them and they were like, dude, bro, I can't help but notice you're having some trouble with the chicks. You just need to go up to them and, you know, be who you are, you know? Flex your muscles a little bit. They love it. And then pats them on the shoulder and walks away. That guy would, I think, deservedly feel frustrated um, because of Chad privilege. The reason we call it Chad privilege is because the, the, the just square jawed gentleman uh, who just walked on by, um, forgot kind of the underlying component of his sexual success, which, let's be clear here, is appearance. That is a big factor. So when you ignore that, and a lot of appearance is, a lot of appearance is at least genetically influenced, you know, a lot of it. Um, and when you ignore that, it's really frustrating. We all know this, don't we? Everybody knows this. Everybody knows this. Every Ben Shapiro watcher, every single person who falls asleep at night after jerking off to fucking 12 Rules for Life, all of them know what Chad privilege is. If a guy did that to them, or the guy was like, well, why don't you just go up and be yourself, bro? Internally, they'd be thinking, you have unrecognized benefits that you aren't aware of that you were born with, that I don't have, and you're ignoring them, and I'm getting angry. We might call that a micro-oppression. Or micro-aggression, uh, sorry, micro-aggression. So these, so I know I can explain Chad, I know I can explain Chad privilege to like any guy in this country. I know I can. So why is it so hard to imagine the white privilege is a thing? If you can acknowledge the Chad privilege is a thing, then your issue isn't the concept of privilege, your issue is with the empirical data describing the existence of white privilege. But here's the thing. The evidence that white people are privileged in our society is greater than the evidence that handsome people are. And that's a fact. If you want to take a look at the total amount of data, the total number of studies, the plurality of that information, the severity of those studies, the extent to which it's been researched, 
it is undeniably, unquestionably a fact that white people's privilege over non-white people is much more evident than handsome people's privilege over ugly people's. But what are you going to do? White privilege and culture. Since white people in America hold most of the political, institutional, economic power, this is what they're underlining? This is, like, factual? Okay. They receive advantages that non-white groups do not. White culture and white racialized identity refer to the way that white people, their custom cultures, and belief operate as the standard by which all of the groups are compared. This is such, like, milk toast shit. I was given harder stuff than this in college. You know? I remember, for my sociology degree, before I completed my baccalaureate thesis, and they took every white student, they would take them one by one, they would put them in the Thunderdome, and they would just have, like, five black dudes beat the shit out of you. Like, that's, um, that was part of my degree, of course. Um, and, uh, yeah, I just, when I see stuff like this, like, th this is, this is nothing in comparison, you know? Um, yeah, no, it was a formative experience, thank you. I won, of course. Obviously. <laughs> My ability to thrive, not just being survived in this country, is preserved to every level of power without me having to do anything at all. I don't even have to vote. Um, dude, they even have data on the right. What the fuck? They're even providing... How much of this tweet thread is just complaining about facts not aligning with your... <sighs> Ten richest Americans, all white. U.S. Congress, 90% white, now 78%. Wait, is that is that true? From 2016 to 2020, we went from 90% white to 78% white. That's a huge shift of, towards representation. That's awesome. U.S. governors, 96% white. Top military advisors, 100% white. President and vice president, 100% white. You could just say both white. It feels weird to say 100% when there are only two people. U.S. House Freedom Caucus, 99% white. Presidential cabinet, 91% white. Teachers, 82% white but only 63% in the San Diego Unified School District. Um, by, by, by president and vice president, I think they just mean current president and vice president, unless they're going with half-white Obama, you know? Full-time college professors, 84% white. The people who decide what TV shows we read, 93% white. The books we read, 90% white. The news is covered, 85% white. Which music is produced, 95% white. Directed top 100 grossing films, 95% white. And, I mean, all this is factually true. I mean, it's... I don't know why conservatives are so upset about it. No, keep in mind, nothing that we've seen so far is a moral condemnation of white people. Like, at all. Wait, hold on. Vosh, this conversation turns ignorant, race-neutral conservatives... First of all, if you're um, conservative, you're not race-neutral. ...into legitimately pro-racism, pro-colonization white people through forcing white people to either feel guilty about their race or take pride in it. No! I'm sorry, I just, I need to be really clear about this. If you're presented with empirical information indicating some racial groups have privilege over other racial groups, and your monkey brain tells you that you either have to be pro, pr pr guilty of being white, or anti-black, that you, you just really low IQ. I don't know how else to say it. That is not, by any means, a necessary physiological response on your part, you know? You're not a puppet. You can choose to process this information like a regular adult, like I do, which is, oh, wow, white people do have advantages. Okay. Isn't that the same argument you had against the cut video, though? The cut video was incredibly awkward, um, repeatedly, consistently um, framed with no discourse or context, things that absolutely seemed racially biased, and it was presented to a general audience. This is a PowerPoint given to professors. This is a PowerPoint given to people with academic credentials. This is not comparable. Yeah, the cut video was just cheap BuzzFeed clickbait, you know? Like, it's not the same. Look, I get you can use white privilege in the correct context, but the uh, woke scolds have already um, th uh, poisoned the well on that phrase, sorry. No, they really haven't. Look, I'm really sorry, but I'm only dealing with facts here. If if your experience seeing a couple of people being obnoxious on Tumblr is so traumatic that it's destroyed your ability to understand racial relations in a nuanced way, you are the problem there, not the woke scolds. Woke scolds are annoying, but you are an autonomous human being with your own mental faculties, and you are the one responsible for how you process information. 
So the fact of the matter is white privilege exists. That's the easiest, simplest, and most empirically demonstrable way to describe it. If you hear that and your internal brain is like you're clicking back to like 2014 Tumblr posts, then you are, you're the problem there, you know? That's unironically like the, the left got too PC, so I changed all my mind on blank. I just said I get it. Other people shut their brain off when they hear that phrase, period. Yeah, of course. Conservatives shut their brains off like to everything. But that's not the fault of the term white privilege. Conservative, trust me, as somebody who's done this for a while, conservatives shut their brain off at the concept, not the terminology. Even if I don't use the term white privilege, the nanosecond you imply that white people have had any systemic benefit in our society, they freak the fuck out. Even if you don't use the term white privilege. You can talk about the optics. I mean, you can say maybe this term's more effective than that term. And I agree, we should explore the optics. I don't think the term white privilege, it's so neutral. Like, there's really nothing weighted about it. White fragility is very weighted for reasons that I think are pretty obvious. But white privilege, I mean, privilege isn't a morally weighted term at all. Everybody is a collection of privileges and disprivileges. All of us. Black people have privileges too. Or at least most black people. Maybe there are some black people who are like trans, disabled, female, quadriplegic, autistic. Like, you can run down the list if you want, but... All of us have some privileges, you know? It doesn't just have to be race or income. It could also be your height. That's a benefit, you know? Some tall people tend to get treated better. Well, tall guys tend to get treated better. It varies for, for women, you know? But yeah, like, it's, it's a simple concept. The fact of the matter is, and let's not beat around the bush, the issue here isn't the terminology. Conservatives just don't want to fix racism. Like, let's not fuck around with this. It's pretty clear. Conservative behavior is poorly explained by an aversion to the term white privilege and excellently explained by an aversion to addressing racism. All of their arguments, the language they use, the people that they take money from, the outcomes of their elections, their votes, what they care and don't care about, it's not a problem with white privilege. It's a problem with, well, racial equality, you know? Or an ignorance to the underlying arguments about these issues, you know? There are people who vote conservative who I don't, I don't think they're all like seething racists or whatever. I think you have to be at least okay with racism to be a conservative in this country. It's still weighted and you can't overlook that? Well, all language is weighted. I'm sorry, can you all think of a term to replace white privilege that conservatives would be okay with? Can you think of one? Have fun with that. Because the nanosecond it gets any kind of traction in the public discourse, it's it's going to it's going to be just as hated as the term white privilege, black debuff. <laughs> uh, all right, how much of this how much of this stupid shit do we have left? Um, we did this one. Uh, oh, we're down to just one more. Oh shit! Finally, teachers are told they must become anti-racist activists. Yeah. Well, oh God. Oh, no. They must confront and examine their white privilege. Yeah, they're educators. They absolutely should be introspective about their biases. Acknowledge when they feel white fragility. Yeah. And teach others to see their privilege. Yeah. They must turn their schools into activist organizations. Now, does there, do they actually say turn their school into activist organizations? Or do they just say confront racism? I, okay, so let's take a look. Anti-racist. One who is supporting an anti-racist policy through their actions or expressing an anti-racist idea. Um, racist, one who is supporting, Vosh, this is zero out of 10 optics. I don't think so. I just think you might be racist. Here's the issue. Everything that I've said and described so far, not a single element of this segment has been me impugning white people. You can go look back through the whole thing. I haven't said a single thing negative about white people once. And I don't think anything negative about white people. What if you're reading like poor like pour material into this or I don't know if you mean the PowerPoint or if you mean what I'm talking about the PowerPoint is for teachers dude it's not for the general public and for the for this segment like even with the PowerPoint we're looking at nothing here is anti-white at all versus a racist one who is supporting Vosh bro they won't be able to tell the difference that's the problem with conservatives again I need to be perfectly clear here Optics is only relevant if it's possible to do better optics while preserving the same idea. If conservatives are constitutionally incapable of hearing these arguments, that's not bad optics. That's them. That's on them. 
Like, would like would you like with the abolitionists back in the 1860s? You, dude, bad optics. The slave owners really don't like it when you say we should abolish slavery. Like, maybe work on that a bit. Like, no, that's they just don't like it because of material conditions dictating their their you know their uh, well their privilege. Uh, anyway, what's the final slide? Confront and examine your white privilege. Acknowledge when you feel white fragility. Teach others to see their privilege. Okay, so they're literally just encouraging education and introspection. Nice. So yeah, literally nothing in here was anti-white. Nothing in here fell outside the purview of what I would expect from uh, a school. And it's funny because the content of this tweet thread, these people would be offended. These people would be offended by the integration of schools back in the 1960s. Unquestionably, undeniably they would. Um, they would say that schools are being turned into activist organizations where whites and blacks against the will of the whites, uh, the white, uh, parents are, um, are, are, are being forced to participate in an activist social experiment. Here's the thing, people, and, uh, racist arguments haven't changed in hundreds of years. They're all the exact same arguments. They have not changed. And if you look back through history, it's incredible. Yeah, they would talk about social engineering and they call the civil rights movement Marxism too. So it's important to remember when, you've, when, you, when you see how these move forward and when you read these arguments to put them in their historical context. Because frankly, a lot of conservatives really are just kind of kept in check by shame. A lot of people in the Republican Party probably do just want to say the N-word and like throw rocks at black people. Um, not all of them, but a lot of them. And the only thing keeping them from doing that is the collective social pressure not to. So one of the most effective tools we have at calling out their racism is to just point out they're doing things identical to what racists did against the civil rights workers. Um, like, and that's pretty much all we can do sometimes uh, because they're not listening to reason. So Conservatives and losing the culture war is a time-honored tradition. This too shall pass, Vosh. Well, the basic line will continue. They'll be using these same arguments in 100 years. It'll just, the line moves forward. Yeah, race mixing too. Yeah, they said that, yeah, race mixing equals communism. That was a really, 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 really big argument that was made all the time. They won't listen to history either. They don't need to listen to history. They just need to be, like, shamed into shutting up. What else are you supposed to do with racism, right? A lot of people say that's a violation of free speech, but unironically, Telling people that you can't shame racists is a violation of their free speech. I have a goddamn First Amendment right to make racists feel bad. That is my fucking right. I'm American. And if you want to take that away from me, then you better take it up with the founding motherfucking fathers, okay? That's my goddamn right. Damn right. At the end of the day, conservative inability to process these arguments um, usually comes down to their belief in... Well, it's a lot of things. But they believe in a meritocracy. It's the myth of a just, the just world fallacy is what it's called. Um, they believe the world is already just as it is. So people who are trying to ameliorate any injustice must actually be trying to assign privilege uh, to a given group of people. Um, you know, so <laughs> it's <sighs> it's so difficult for them to follow through on. It's you know, it's it's really how does this how does this tweet thread end? Let me see. The guy ends with like a picture of himself. I love that, dude. Um, okay, this, this. Parents should be up in arms. Public schools should be designed to serve the public good, not the private ideological fantasies of far left activists. Literally the same thing they said during the civil rights movement and school integration. P.S. You can support my investigative reporting on critical race theory with a five or ten dollar monthly donation. It's time to push back. Oh, the bar is so low, dude. And if you want to see more tweet threads like this, where I misrepresent the concepts presented in the screenshots I linked here, uh, pl please subscribe. Please subscribe to my Patreon. The shamelessness. I would never link my Patreon in a fucking tweet thread. My God, that is who. That is uh that is uh that is uh that is, uh, that is a rough one. Look at this dude. <laughs> oh God.